Well, let me welcome you to our event on behalf of SCICN and the Stanford Initiative for Religious and Ethnic Understanding and Coexistence. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here uh, tonight for this event with Professor Abishai Margali. Before moving on, I, I would like to say a word about the Stanford Initiative for Religious and Ethnic Understanding and Coexistence. This has been a special initiative, uh, which is, as far as I can tell, has been largely spearheaded through the efforts of Steve Weitzman, uh, the director of the Taube Center for Jewish Studies, that is supported financially by the President's Fund, the Center for Comparative Study uh, of Race and Ethnicity, and uh, the Religious Studies Department, as well as uh, the Taube Center itself. The initiative has been very generous in funding a number of events that SCICN is organizing today and tomorrow, again starting with tonight's event, on issues related to non-violent or unarmed uh, resistance in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Tomorrow we'll be holding another event, Nonviolent Resistance and Diplomacy, Prospects for Success in Israel-Palestine, with the renowned journalist and uh, pundit, commentator on Middle East and political affairs, Ronnie Khoury, who will be in a discussion moderated by our own Janine Zakaria, uh, who is here as well, the Carlos and Kelly McClatchy visiting lecturer in the Department of Communications and former Washington Post Bureau Chief in Jerusalem. And that event will start at 12 noon tomorrow in room 28A, open to the public, and lunch will be served. Um, okay, but now for tonight's event, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Abishai Margulies. Uh, I will give the kind of uh, introduction that um, Abishai really hates uh, and often stops me midway through, but I will do it anyway. He's been described as Israel's foremost philosopher. He's one of the world's leading thinkers and commentators on the contemporary human condition, the moral issues of our time, and current problems facing Western societies. He's written widely about ethics, religion, culture, and contemporary Israeli politics. Um, in addition to his influence as a philosopher, he's highly regarded for his profound and cogent observations of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Middle Eastern region, and the broader, broader struggle between Islam and the West. Uh, professor Margulin was the Shulman Professor of Philosophy at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, a fact that he joined in 1970, and, and has since uh, uh, 2006 been Professor Emeritus there. From 2006 to 2011, he was the George F. Kennan Professor at the Institute for the Advanced Study at Princeton University. He's also been a visiting scholar at Harvard, Princeton, Oxford, and of course, Stanford and universities. Uh, prominent among his many publications are the books Idolatry with Moshe Halbertal, The Decent Society, Views and Review, Politics and Culture of the State of the Jews, The Ethics of Memory, Orientalism, The West in the Eyes of Its Enemies with Ian Baruma, and on Compromise and Rotten Compromises, uh, published in 2009. The latter book was based in part on the 2005 uh, Tanner Lectures on Human Values that Abishai delivered here at Stanford University. He is also a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books. In addition, Professor Margulin is a founder of Peace Now, a co-founder of Peace Now, the Israeli peace movement that has called for the recognition of the rights of Palestinians and self-determination in their own state alongside Israel. In 2001, he received the Spinoza Lens Prize, awarded by the International Spinoza Foundation, for making a significant contribution to the normative debate on society. He's also the recipient of Israel's Emmett's Prize in the Humanities and the, Israeli Prize, the Israel Prize in Philosophy. Uh, Abishai earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees at Hebrew University. Uh, and having run through that exhaustive uh, reading of the CV, I uh, invite you now to join me in welcoming uh, Abishai Marley to the podium. problem for us academicians is to have a biography, not a CV. <laughs> That's hard. So thank you for, for your extensive and gracious introduction. I thought about <clears throat> talk today and I googled Israeli newspapers in the recent weeks. What is the main topic? John Kerry is there, but that's really a marginal thing. And the main issue is the collapse of the hospital in Jerusalem, the main hospital, Hadassah. 
collapse in the sense of economic collapse, not the building. And uh, I thought at the beginning to use it as an example that although negotiations are taking place and maybe something will be clearer in the coming month, but it's not on the agenda of the Israelis, or at least not in a major way. And Hadassah is as removed, I thought, from the reality of the negotiations as you can get. So I thought that, well, I mean, what Hadassah has to do with the Middle East? And then I reflected a bit on Hadassah. And I remember Solzhenitsyn's allegory of the cancer ward. It's Uzbekistan in 1955. And he used the ward there, the cancer ward, as an allegory, a metaphor of Russia. And, uh, and I thought about my experience in the cancer ward three years ago when my wife was there with lung cancer. And I spent a great deal of time there. She died there. And I thought about the cancer ward as an allegory and metaphor for Israel. And it's a very different metaphor from the one that Solzhenitsyn had. I discovered something which wasn't metaphorical in the least. The structure of the ward was such that the nurses were mainly Russian immigrants with all the Russian names of Natalia and you name it. Many of the male nurses were Arabs, including some of the doctors. Some of the doctors were Russians. And some Israeli bones who were the head of the whole thing. And even an ultra-Orthodox Jew as a male nurse. The people who were in the ward were Arabs and Jews, ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, atheists, agnostics, and you name it. And it, a cancer ward is a different planet. The planet of the ill is not the planet of the healthy. But something there really shattered me. Shattered in the good sense. I used to come in the very early in the morning, stay the whole day, sometimes even sleeping there. And all the tensions between Russian Jews, immigrants who hate the East, vote for Lieberman, most likely, for the ultra-right or the right. And that's most likely what these Russian nurses are voting. And the Arabs there who I talked to you know, vote for the Arab parties, Ballad and the Communist Party. And then not, not to say the people who were there. And all of it wasn't there. There were, peop there were two categories, the sick people and the people who try to help them. It was sheer humanity. And the only attribute is the attribute that humans in general carry. Either you are sick or you are healthy and can help. And that was the only thing. And it was, and it's very clear that the moment the people there, visitors and the people who were sick and the doctors and the nurses all got out of the ward they were thrown into a different reality of being at each other's throat. 
And uh, there was something bizarre getting out of the world to the, the real world, which looked inferior in so many ways to the cancer world. Whereas in Solzhenitsyn, the cancer world is basically a place where all the evils of the Russian purges are there. And people are trying to give an account of the worst things that they did. The council ward that I experienced was utterly different. And the question that really bo bothered me greatly, why, how come that when people face this kind of ultimate reality, they behave so utterly different and willing to shed and to throw away all the tribal differences that bog them down. The point is that I don't want to use this word, cancer word, as an allegory because it's an allegory to nothing. It's a modular reality confined to the place. And there, there is something else. And there is no way to transfer it to the general public. It cannot be re-duplicated in the outside world. And uh, this brings me so, this brings me now to talk politics not about the council world, not about allegory, but about something with a, which has a sense of reality in the, diff in, in the bad sense, in some sense. I guess, as, uh, let me say that as much as I hate to agree with the defense minister of Israel, there is one thing that I agree with him is that, that John Kerry is obsessive and messianic. He thinks it's a bad thing. I think it's a very good thing. Because only one, only one who is obsessive and messianic is willing to take, to burden this cross on himself and do all what he's doing. To the point in which all the people around wouldn't have given one in nine to the chance that something will come out of it. That's even a high rate of betting. One in 99 is even more to the point. And yet, we all know that he's neither stupid nor irredeemably naive. He knows something that maybe we don't know. And suddenly, people are raising a bit the probability. Maybe something is there. It can't be that someone is coming and going, taking all those travels with all the with all those hours of spending, going. I mean, the same. I mean, the same chore. The same the same speeches, the same boring speeches to go over and over. Something must be there. And the feeling is that now, maybe, before the fourth round of release of Arab prisoners, there, were, there was a decision, I mean, this was a condition for getting into the negotiations, that there will be rounds of releasing Arab prisoners. And the fourth round is the most, the bitterest for the Israelis, the Israeli Jews to take, and that's the release of Arab Israelis who murdered Israelis. And therefore, usually the government offsets those bitter, this bitter pill by doing something outrageous, more settlements, uh, declaring on more set buildings in the West Bank and so on to offset the the rounds, either as an excuse or really to offset or to quell the criticism of the right. This time, 
I believe that there is a chance that Kerry will come up with this frame before to preempt the reaction to the release. And maybe, if I'm right on the schedule, it's the end of March is the time. Now, we people who are not in the thicket of it and not in running things, we usually are wrong about the schedule, not necessarily about what will happen as much as about the schedule and the political schedule. But that's my best hunch that something will come. What will come out of it? I don't know, if at all. But I have a test to say if it's significant or not. If it splits the Israeli government, then it's serious. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's not. And the same about the Palestinians. You know by their reaction. And it's immaterial what is the content of the frame. Sharon accepted the roadmap, and so Kurt Abu Mazen. The roadmap of Bush was one of the best documents that the Palestinians ever got. But it was clear to both sides that they won't do anything for it. That they can somehow, I mean, it was ne Bush needed it to show that there is an advancement in the, in the Middle East, not only in Iraq, democracy in the Middle East. He needed some achievement, so he came with this plan. So all right, they easily deflect. No one left the government because of that. So the test is not the wording, not the content, but how serious it is. It will be judged by whether it has enough power to split the right, to split the government. And if it doesn't, even if they all stay uh, in both sides, you know that it's not serious, no matter what they agree. So that's basically the test that uh, I am proposing. Now, the Palestinians have a plan B in case the negotiations will end with nothing which is still the most likely scenario. But not the Israelis. Israelis still have only a reactive thing. What I believe is the Palestinians' plan B. The issue of both sides understand the negotiation as basically who at the end will be blamed for the failure of the negotiation. It's the most likely thing. To, and the, and it's the issue is what will be, who, first of all, who will declare whether the Americans will side say you are to be blamed or you are to be blamed, or at least indicate tacitly who is to be blamed. So both sides obviously try everything not to be blamed and introduce all sorts of things. I mean, in order to preempt it, they don't recognize Israel as a Jewish state or whatever the condition, I'll say something about it. But the main, the, the, the main game is that preparation for who is to be blamed. And the Palestinians obviously need, for them it's crucial, because I think that plan B of the Palestinian is to isolate Israel politically. And to isolate Israel for partly by promoting the Palestinians and partly by really isolating by, by the various forms of the boycott or boycotts. And I think that that's, that's first of all, that has, from that point of view, an advantage that I think Abu Mazen truly believe that violence won't bring anything, that the Israelis definitely prefer violence than boycott. And therefore, and this has to do with the theme here about violence and nonviolence, and I'll say something about this topic. For the Israelis, it's not clear even what is plan B. And here's the paradox for the Israelis. 
What happens in the Middle East is dismembering and the dismemberment of the national states, the ethnic composition of the, eth of the ethnic of the national states dismembered into the ethnic constituents all over. Not Egypt, but definitely in Syria, definitely Lebanon, either it's sectarian, in various ways of sectarianism, but usually along ethnic or sectarian religious lines. Now, this is an argument for many Israelis, especially for the right of this government. Well, we, it's a dangerous situation around, and the best strategy is wait and see, don't do anything. The paradox here that not doing anything is creating Israel as a state that potentially will be dismembered like all the countries around. It will be Lebanon. It will be a binational state, call it whatever name. Master states, apartheid, it doesn't matter really how you call this political entity. But whatever it is, the entity, it's an invitation for creating a reality in which it will be binational political entity that has the potential, most likely thing, to blow away the way all the countries around are. So on the one hand, say, look what happens around. Those countries are dismembered. And then you create and you, a self-defeating scenario in which you create the reality of the next blow up to, of, the real, of the political body. And this happens. And, uh, and this paradox is not, this paradox is there to stay. And I'll say something about the probability of it happening. But I want to say something about violence and non-violence. And especially from an Israeli point of view. The crucial event to my mind in Palestine, the crucial period for the Palestinians is not 48. It's the, it's the Arab revolt from 36 to 39. It was an Arab revolt against the British mandate, they were the rulers, but to stop basically the immigration of Jews to Palestine and to stop the Zionist project there. It was a very successful revolt for a while. There was even time when they even took for a few days, I mean, term, organizationally speaking. It was the most concerted effort that the Palestinians were able to mount. They even conquered Jerusalem for a few days. Is that true? I, am I right? No. That they conquered Jerusalem, I think, for a few days. Yeah which is inconceivable, actually, when you come to think. And uh, but then, of course, what had took place were they were on three fronts, fighting the British, trying to fight the Jews. And I'll say something about that. That's part of what I'm about to say. And the main thing was a civil war among themselves. They ended up as a fragmented, destroyed society. They lost 5,000 people, Jews 400, the British about 15, uh, 150. That's, I think, more or less were the numbers. But they were devastated. The British were very harsh. There was really bombardment of villages from the air. 
And in 48, it's like in the second, they came with utter, as a disorganized community that was defeated some years ago. Whereas the Jewish Yeshuv, the Jewish community in Palestine before 48, used 36 and 39 partly as accessory forces to the British. 16,000 Jews from a community of 300,000, even less, at the time, were trained properly. And so the, this is the background. And I think that if, when I come to think of the Palestine, I think really, I mean, 48 was still dangerous to the Yeshuv because of the Arab forces, but the Palestinians lost, at least in the second round. Now, what is interesting in the issue was that the moral discussion about violence and nonviolence. And what they meant is the revisionist, it was about Jewish pride. I think Amos once told me that Jews, all, I mean, all Jewish recipes are orthopedic. The, how, the, how the back should be. For the revisionist, it should be straight and we should be very proud. Labor movement, you should toil the land. And for rabbinic Jews, you have to sit all over and bend your back. So it's all about orthopedic, how to treat the Jewish problem as an orthopedic problem. But so, but there was a tremendous revulsion on the Haganasa, the main yeshuv, from the, the, the use of the Irgun, and later on sprinting group of the Irgun, of terror. I think that the one who introduced car bombs to the world, the first one to use was Shamir in 38 in the Jaffa Gate in Jerusalem. I think he's the first to use it. So there was a wave of terror, and the whole discussion was about violence and nonviolence. But of, of both sides were violent means. The point is, will it be a discipline? And the Haganah called it restrain, Havlaga. Named, and part of it, apart from the moral issues and the political issues, the idea was, and that was Bell Katzenelson, the sort of the Lechanov of the labor movement, the ideologue of the labor movement, said, what we have to stop is a blood feud. Because in a blood feud, we won't be the last to say the word. Once we get into rounds of a blood feud in Palestine, and this is what this will bring about, we are doomed. And I think that this fear, and another thing, we have to restrain, if you can control your people and show restraint, it means that you deserve a state. It's a sign of maturity. If revenge takes place, it's almost against the barbarian thing of monopoly on violence. You don't control violence. I think that Fayyad and Abu Mazen understand it very well. But violence doesn't serve them at all. Arafat was ambivalent and didn't control in the Second Intifada. I thought he wanted to stir things up, to show that something, but then lost control. And I think the main thing for the Palestinians is, can they now hold together if the negotiations will fail, and most likely they will fail. So I believe that in order to preempt it, they will try very hard 
to push hard on delegitimizing Israel. So now it's BDS or all sorts of non-NGOs organizations, but then it will become a real movement. I think that Kerry warned Israel, and I think there is credibility to this war. Up to now, people exaggerate the extent of the yes, and every obscure university, if someone raised criticism of Israel right away, I mean, people are, but I think the reality is there. And, and this happened to South Africa quite rapidly, once it started. People dragged their feet for a long time, and then suddenly the whole thing collapsed and, and the boycott took place. And that is a very serious problem for Israel. But then there are many aspects, and people here know more about them than I do. But I think one thing is mentioned recently, but I pushed this idea a long time. One of the part of the crisis of Israel is a moral crisis. And I, I use the analogy, not, I saw Eva Illus, someone wrote a, a piece which, with the analogy I used, it's very much like the debate between the abolitionist and the pro-slave movement here. It was a moral crisis. Slavery turned into a moral crisis. Now the abolitionists, even to the end, were a minor, minor voice in a way, an articulate voice, an impressive voice, but still not in, I mean, it takes Lincoln to make it into something. But there was a moral crisis around slavery. Most Israelis are pretty satisfied with the status quo. Had they had guaranteed that the status quo can go on, they would have subscribed to it in no time. It serves them fine. <coughs> they don't know the, the rest. They, they mistrust, actually, the rest. And the status quo now is more than bearable for the, the Israeli Jews. But they feel that maybe, maybe they take a ride on the Titanic. And maybe it's all a party on the Titanic, <laughs> all this. And it, they don't articulate, but it's in the back of many people's mind. They have the feeling that it's not a stable situation. It can, it can flare up and erode quite rapidly. Now, what does it say about the future? We are, I, we are not good in predicting anything, really. And uh, I started now go over predictions of famous leaders, the Zionist leaders, about what will be the future in the future is unbelievable, the silliness, once you know what actually took place. We are not terribly good in predicting, but if I had to, and I, I'm forced to address what will happen in the future, the drift is towards doing to inertia and doing nothing. That's the main drift and the most likely thing to happen. So once you think of cancer. In the cancer world, it's all hope against hope. The probability is not on your side, but you fight. Hope against hope. It's exactly what the whole Ascribe to Abraham, hope against hope. I don't know who had the idea, I don't think Nadesh Damanushka's book in English is Hope Against Hope, but she didn't give the name, right? She, although she's called Nadeshda, which is, which is, yeah. Hope 
which means, I mean, it just makes it very apt. But I think it's the British editor who gave the name, but it's a brilliant name, exactly to what you described. Those I don't know. But I can be as a spectator, you can think that the probabilities are running against me. As an activist, it's both against the hockey fight. <clears throat> I don't think that we have to falsify the probabilities in order to motivate you. Just tell it the way it is in a cancer war. Just tell it the way it is and you fight. But I think that there are very good reasons <coughs> to be gloomy. Unless the messianic and relentless John Kerry takes the rabbit out of his sleeve. So I stop here and wait for your question. Thank you very much, I was trying, on, on this theme or issue of um, nonviolence, um, you know, one of the things that we will be going, Byron and then Deirdre and I will be going um, to, to the region in, in March and we really want to talk with folks who are involved in the nonviolent uh, resistance or unarmed resistance activities. And one of the things that we're trying to figure out is who their audience is, Right, to what extent are, is, are their actions aimed at the international community to invite them to put uh, more pressure on Israel? But there's also a way in which the nonviolent activities could be directed at Israel and could um, be aimed at producing a shift in Israeli attitudes about uh, uh, about about the Palestinian conflict. And so you said um, that uh, uh, Israel is. Um, Israeli, Israelis prefer violence to nonviolence. So I'm wondering if you can say more about what, I, I, I what, say, what impact, sure, sure, sure. what transformative effect, if any, does nonviolence have on Israel? The thing I learned most is, in the time I was active is that the hardest problem if you run an organization, especially a protest movement, is maintenance. How to keep the people still committed. They should, you should give them something on the way. If the negotiations will fail, it's not the fact that few diplomats will run in the world trying to resume the boycott or extend it doesn't leave the kids in the territories doing their stuff. Maintenance will be a serious problem. Palestinians view violence as not violence means hot, hot arm, namely not strong, stone throwing is not violent. It's part of a protest. Israelis think stone throwing is violent. You can kill. And Israelis are far more. I mean, seeing an army soldiers being hit by a by a stone, Israelis take it far more seriously than, let's say, the proverbial woman from a developmental town being hit. And that's not just a matter of fact. He's a kid. He's our child. With a, Palestinians see him with a, as a helmeted machine war. The Israeli thing is as a kid. Uh, you take them when they are 18 and they are our kids. So stone throwing is exactly the point, the gray area, where the Palestinians would think as they thought in the first intifada. Now, in the first intifada, it started as actually as a non-violent, I mean, stone throwing, but not violent. It really started as a popular reaction, and the PLO were terrified that they are losing control. The people in Tunisia didn't know what's going on. The Israelis wanted to shift it into a violent conflict where we can do And they came up with a list of wanted people and made them an outlaw. 700 people. That's when violence really started. And that's Israelis felt much better. This you can deal with. Now, 
I don't see the Palestinians running the show after only by having a few officials from the PLO running in the world and trying to delegitimize Israel. Need maintenance. And there will be pressure from the Hamas. So it will start with stones falling or something of that kind. And then, the, then you don't know. And the dynamics is unclear. So it's not just, I mean, the, they don't have the authority that even Arafat over the kids. And he didn't when it became crucial. And uh, so now you ask me, let's assume that they do all sorts of things, but they are non-violent and even recognized as non-violent by the Israelis. What will be the effect? It, a great deal depends on what will be the reaction in the world. And, uh, there are two few crucial states here. Germany is very important, namely Merkel and the government, and of course the United States. But let's assume that the United States, well, I mean, I don't know, it will be here. They will be encouraging the European to act, and they will stay behind in a Libyan type of, you are on the driving seat, we are on the back seat. Then it depends which countries in Europe. We, sort of exert pressure. So when they exerted pressure, for example, there was this program Horizon, and namely that Israel won't get the grants from the European Union for research. Netanyahu uh, yielded to the pressure. They know that I mean, this is serious. The great deal depends on how it will be conducted and what kind of... And, uh, it's very hard to... to, to uh, first of all, all those things... For example, the, the BDS, when they say boycott Israel, now they can even understand that even if there will be an agreement, they will go on with a boycott till all the refugees will be... I mean, till all the refugees have the option to go back. Well, and that's not even in the cards, not even on the policy. They know. So that's, in that sense, I think, and the is what they want really to delegitimize Israel in a grand way. It's Israel is the problem for many of them. How it will work, and therefore it's an easy, it's an easy, <clears throat> but what I'm saying is, the Palestinian leadership, they had to throw raw meat to their people. And once they throw raw meat, you don't really know where it is. That's basically it. And to predict what will be the reaction is so contingent and so conditional that whatever I say to you, it's not serious. Yes. <coughs> but I don't like what? No, 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 it's my... <coughs> I'd like you to address what I think is a, another paradox. The history of nonviolent movement, movements, certainly in the United States and also, of course, in India, was such that when nonviolence uh, was met with nonviolence, with kind of lawful conduct, it wasn't very successful. For nonviolence to succeed, it had to prompt a violent response. It had to prompt a violent response which people <coughs> Uh, reacted to with revulsion and a sense of it not being consistent with their view of themselves. So isn't the paradox uh, <coughs> in 
in the uh, Palestinian territories in the West Bank, isn't the paradox that uh, they, one way or another, to be successful, have to force a violent response, well, and and that then raises the issue. <laughs> sure. No, they know they know it's very good. for the right wing. That's an obvious problem. Sure. For the left wing, it's a peculiar problem because they want to see, sure, sure. they want to see the uh, the state make significant concessions. So, is it really the case that the that the left has to hope that there'll be violent rather than non-violent responses? See. Let's, let's start with a story here. I remember many years ago, there was this Mubarak Awad that came from the States and started talking about non -value. The Palestinian couldn't stand it. They thought it's unmanly. That was the main reaction. And they even used the expression that uh, the right wing and the old revisionist years what was yeah, what was taken by force and then regained by force. Then it's not just a it's a matter of pride or dignity is not just a matter of not just a matter of regaining, but regaining in a particular way. And he he became he made a nuisance of himself. What is interesting is that the Israelis understood right away the protection, not the Palestinians. That is dangerous. And they forced him out. And at that time, when we talked to Palestinians about non-violent resistance, it looked to them ridiculous. Egypt changed it, Tunisia changed it, and we talked to the kids, the Palestinian kids that, that I meet, quite regularly, they all now, I mean, they, I, I said they're more reflective, do things that it should be non-violent. They don't really know what exactly, but they think that they should, they are suddenly, there is a change of attitude. The, we also, I mean, many of you here saw the, the movie in Berlin. And then you see it's a ritual where you basically demonstrate in order to draw the army to overreact. Now, all organizations, non-state organizations, are built on propaganda by action. You want an overreaction by those in power and in force to overreact. And therefore, you recruit people and you create sympathy to your cause and so on. The logic of resistance is always to force the other side to overreact. For the other side not to overreact, you need two things. First, an awareness that it doesn't serve you. And secondly, real discipline. And Israelis are not terribly disciplined. Not a terribly disciplined society. It's not unruly, but it's not terminus. And then there is a new element. That's the settlers. And, uh, okay. and they will overreact because they want to force Israel really to overreact in order to some of them, whatever they think, to, to expel, to get rid of the Arabs, really to do something radical. So it doesn't matter now what even the army is thinking or what the government is thinking. There are enough elements that will force the end to overreact. And therefore, the whole idea of understanding the paradox, don't overreact in order not, because overreacting is exactly what they want you, that's not the logic of the situation here. By those who will overreact, and you know it for sure. I cannot predict lots of things. This I'm pretty sure will happen. Yes. Uh, is it to be very certain that uh, the discussions, the negotiations, will fail 
and perform the result in the, the gains of the project. But equally likely it would be a different kind of a future in which the two sides accept Kerry's proposal. Of course, if there's a measure that can make it meaningless, but this will give Kerry enough ammunition to perpetuate the discussion for another few months. Yes. At which time the elections in the United States will come likely, which will allow a little bit more than 50% chance of support for Israel, which will, might prevent the Arabs from doing anything significant in the till the end of the year. So we are going to probably continue the same sort of thing till the end of the year, and in politics, nine months is a long time. No, 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 what you say is a, it's a, it is a possibility, no question. All I describe you, first of all, I mean, if this would happen, then this would happen, I mean, that's for the birds. Yeah. I mean, but what you describe is, but obviously, Kerry won't, we do everything not to declare failure. And especially in the not failure before election. Secondly, the trouble is, well, it's not trouble, it's actually what makes him noble in a way. He really believes in something here. If it were just playing on time, that's a different game. He's not playing on time. I mean, that, in any, either he fakes sincerity and he deludes me. But I don't think so. It's almost a Gary Cooper in High Moon. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, therefore, I think that he's trying really to come up with a proposal. If the both sides agree, even in a meaningless way, then he earns few money. But if, and, uh, I'm talking about really the logic of it. I'm not talking really what he may have for me. So it may be another one. Yes. And nothing good will happen in another one. We know, I mean, this we know. Now the problem of this we know, and secondly, the whole idea that they are wait, they will calculate and they are waiting to election in the United States. Election here for most people, I mean, America is beyond the, is in the outer Mongolia. I mean, it's a little, so I mean, what will, it can take all sorts of turns and things. What I believe is that he can come up with a frame. Right? I don't see if the New York Times is right, and the wording will be such, no matter what he means. There will be a mention, 67 Boulder is the basis, and then land swap of one on one. I don't see this government going on. If this government doesn't go on, then it's serious. If they can, if he comes up with a formula that they can pepper, uh, and, 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 and so, so if he are well, they fudge, and people with this and that, and with the, with the, the two sides will eventually agree and, and they recognize all this, you know, officialese, bullshit officialese, then I don't think it will work. He can, then he buys really. If it's serious, then it's serious, and then we have to see what happens on both sides. If it's not serious, he buys some time if the two sides decide to postpone it. Uh, but not too much to my mind. That's my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, um, I want to go back to your, to not the um, paradox that Lee was talking about, but the first paradox that you talked about. And I'd like you to explain, um, explain it a little bit more. And let, me, let me frame the question. Um, you were talking about the, the larger regional problem of sectarianism and dismemberment of the state. And the paradox is that if you do nothing to hedge your bets and to try to stay the course, you may end up propelling exactly that. But I'd like you to say more about it, because on one hand, dismemberment of the state around ethnic lines is a, you know, pulling apart is a, but then the irony built into it is that there could be a de facto binational state, which is a merging of two groups. And then 
I'd like you to talk about, when you talk about blowing up the political body, talk a little bit about what kind of scenario you imagine could happen. I talked to my good friend in Moshe that as we talked about this part of his thing. We talked this morning exactly about, about this problem. I believe that all this talk about bin it won't be a binational state. It will be no binational state. It will be a master, it will be a master's democracy, own democracy. Namely, that uh, as it is now in the world, that's basically that we are the masters and they will be. Uh, will be some form of, it's bound to stands of a sort. That's actually the reality of it. The reality in the West Bank, it's a bound to stand reality. And that's exactly what, the, what they try to do in South Africa. Terms will be different, but that's basically that. To think that you will include that there will be a state and sort of full-fledged. Right? I mean, Lebanon was an easy case before people speak the same language, belong to the same ethnic group, and it differed on, on religious. And the Maronites believe that as long as they control the means of the Department of Statistics, they can run the show. They will just declare that they're the majority. And for a, long, for a long time, that's exactly what happened. Even when it became more and more clear that they are not the majority. Here, the chances of having even a seeing, even the good times of Lebanon is beyond. I, I don't see it. And most likely, the whole thing will be just an invitation to a terrible civil war. And Israelis won't take it. Like this. It's a mad idea to my mind. A binational state now, as it, especially if you, you have to say something about Gaza, the Palestinians would say something. The whole idea. So what they now do, there is a new way coming now. It's like the climate change. Suddenly there are people negotiating facts of, about the world. I mean, how many Arabs are there in the West Bank? Palestinians. So you have a whole you know, institute. So such a, suddenly there are less than a million disappeared, million and a quarter disappeared from there, so if it's only self, we can cope with it. I mean, you have all those, I mean, it's exactly the Maronite's trick. As long as you, as you are making, as long as you count, it's not matter how many vote, it depends who counts. So as long as we count, that's all there is, to, that's rubbish. Now there is a new element that that's... So now there is, all right, the, the in Netanyahu suddenly realized that well, it should be two states. And uh, then obviously, two states to two people. I think that the party that conned this slogan was the Communist Party. They were the ones to call it. And they were right to say it. It's a national conflict and it should be divided according to the national line and two, two nation states, a Jewish state and then Palestinians and Arabs. So now the new element in the negotiation, and that's what now became yes, an article of faith, that Palestinians should recognize Israel as a Jewish state. On the face of it, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, it's a national conflict, and it should be divided according to national lines, and there will be two nation states, and you call it Arab state and a Jewish state. State of the Jews, and that's all there is to it. Why don't they recognize? I think they are rightly. They, they shouldn't recognize. And let me explain why the Palestinians should be, shouldn't recognize. As long as it's just a description of two states, nation states, 
as the, as the communist meant it, and as we all, when we advocated this solution, advocated it. It was a beautiful shoot. There will be a Jewish state that will fulfill the self-determination of the Jews, and there will be an Arab state fulfilling it. But Jewish here became so ideologically loaded in the name of a Jewish state, there is Jew policy of Judaization of the Galilee, of basically every nasty measure is justified as an in, as a, an implementation of the idea of the Jewish state. Then, if I were a Palestinian, say, look, I'm willing to recognize Israel as sovereign state. You do your nasty stuff as a sovereign state. I want it to. You want me now to accept your ideology to do it to my people. That there will be 20% of my people in your land. You want me to justify you in what you do to me, ideologically, by recognizing it as a Jewish state. That's untenable. Secondly, I mean, I, I, I think I know what it means, a Jewish state. In the, they, are, they are afraid of what they will want to do. So the first stage will be a very reasonable thing. All the Israelis who left the country will, will have the right to vote. Which is all right. I mean, in many countries. The second stage will be all the Jews who spent five years in Israel will have the right to vote. Because it's a Jewish state. It's the state of the Jews all over the world. We represent the Jewish state. So the way to overcome the demographic problem will be exactly the along with this line. It will be big. And if I'm a Palestinian, I say, look, you won't, I won't, I'm willing to recognize it as a, Israel as a sovereign state. And you sovereign state do nasty stuff without others intervening. But you will want me, you want me for me an ideological acceptance of them, and that's I can't cannot do. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the nonviolence and the students you talk to who say, yes, they think nonviolence <coughs> is the right thing, but maybe they're not quite sure why or if there's really a strategy here. And um, on the one hand, so that's there, but if the talks break down, then you think the Palestinian plan B is delegitimization, but that won't work if it's violent. I mean, that has to be not violent. Absolutely. Um, so the question is, that in a way, uh, do you see a kind of a clear path, as it were, if the, if the talks fail, nonviolence will become more deeply entrenched among Palestinians. If there's a deal, and if it's a serious deal, you say both sides will split, and therefore presumably the the more radical wings on both sides might say, no, we must be violent. Right. So it would be a, a, an uneasy center which is committed to non-violence. That, that's is that's that exactly what I mean. That's exactly what I mean. First of all, in order, in order to gain support of the world, you need the, high, the moral high ground. In order to the moral high ground, you can't be violent. You cannot be violent. Then you need real discipline. And it's not clear that the heaven is. If it will be recognized by both sides, namely, both sides here means the Hamas and the, and the Palestinian Authority, that there will be a declaration, the negotiation of faith, if the Hamas wants a, a such a declaration. And there will be a, a joint project. Now we are going to isolate Israel and we call for discipline, for a national discipline, not to escalate the Iranian need, that has a chance. And this is not impossible. Namely that the Hamas then will say, all right, as long as you declare <coughs> the, this faith, and now it's your project is to delegitimize Israel, we are all for it, and we'll restrain our Forces both in Gaza and in the West Bank. Mainly, I mean, the, the Palestinian Authority basically—it's like 
Kavzayin They run basically, Ramallah and his periphery, the, the, more, so the more prosperous. If you take to the area about Hebron in, in the village of the that's a different story. And you need the Hamas in order to have a really a disciplined community deciding a non violent We'll try to isolate them, but we'll be disciplined. And that's, that's a possibility. That's not an impossibility. This will ask for I mean, then, then it depends on how, how Kerry and Abu Mazen will understand. Because at the end of the day, it's Kerry who calls the shot. And he will be very hesitant to declare it a failure. So it depends uh, how it works. My hunch is that we'll know something at the end of next month. Something. But what do I do? Yes? Um, if the negotiations fail, I'm afraid that I can point out to uh, more fire uh, on both parts and the extremes on both sides. They can destroy both sides. I'm thinking about the settlers, right wing, and also Hamas and uh, militants of Hamas. And the issue is the Havana Sharif, the temper march. In this sense, we can go, <laughs> your uh, periodization is very interesting, 36, and then we can go to 20 months. We fight all of the uh, Western war, and this is going to be very, very sensitive, very explosive. No, I'm sure that you saw the, the figure that 30% of the Israelis, this was in Aris, based on a very good a survey, want to rebuild the temple. And you know what it means. And it, it's going to mean not only a conflict in Israel, but between Islam and Judaism all over. So this is, and this I think, why it's so important that Kerry doesn't fail. Because then hell is open. No, sure. There are so many. First of all, there are so many ways. I mean, in a way, you need two or three determined cells to blow up the Middle East, or you need those that, the underground that try to blow up the the, the Haram, fake by sheer by by sheer accident in a way that suddenly. The guardian on the, the Muslim guardian was awake. I mean, that that between him and the, the Third World War was a guy who was awake in the right moment. Unless that he was ticked off, or who knows? But if the story is as it is told, it's with sheer luck. The things that come, the, the, the things in the Middle East can go very, very wrong. We know, and all you need is a I mean, Group determined that we need to shell Ben Gurion Airport. Forget about the Hara. If, uh, if someone will shell uh, the Ben Gurion Airport, the whole thing can go so so wild. So we are all, it's a cliffhanging, the whole story. And to try to come with two scenarios, I mean, it's up to our, I mean, how imaginative we are. And you're right, I mean, the thing, most likely something will happen. Most likely to see it all right now, we take a rational decision how to respond. And then, well, that's yeah, you know, that, that's a complicated thing. I can see the Gurion Zionist movement controlling a great you know, I don't see the Palestinian community as that organized. That's, that's a huge difference. They try to emulate the Gurion, but uh, that's very hard. I mean, it was a Leninist, and that was, that was the central aspect. Yeah, I don't see them being that organized, and therefore you may be very right. And let's pray that uh, the uh, messianic obsession of Kerry will carry on. <laughs> yes. Doctor, do you support a boycott yourself? No. No kind of it, no form of it. No, but it's a, it's a complicated no. I definitely am against academic. 
I was a gangster academic boycott from South Africa. So it's not the term it is. It's a long story I can uh, I was against uh, the boycott from South Africa, I was on other things. Boycott boycott of Israel will really enhance the paranoia in Israel. Most of the Israelis are not the same, so then there will be 60%, 70%. So the whole world against that, that we believe anyway. Now we got the confirmation. It's an anti Semitic world. We should stand together to solidify the right like nothing else. That will be the, the boycott result. If, if, if America will stay, will boycott you, then you don't have to even, you just have to hint that you're going to do it, and that's the end of the story. Americans can finish it tomorrow. You don't send replacement to the Air Force, and that's the end of the story. Israel cannot, I mean, cannot survive a week without Americans. But if what you mean is NGOs boycott, that's a very bad idea. No, I'm asking because you said the violence is not going to work to prod Israelis. They don't respond to it, right? So it seems like boycott is the kind of non-violence that is the other option, right? No, no, there are lots of options. We did say that. There are lots of options. General strike is an option. Many things are options. So other non-violent sure. prod many, measures. Many, there, are many, there are many ways. You can go sit in along the green line of the whole population. Marching to the Green Line, marching to Jerusalem, the whole population. I mean, there was, a, there was this happening in uh, Al Choma. We just now trying to again with all the villages around. Only three people from the villages came. I mean, it depends. I mean, uh, many of them are. You see, Israel devastated, really, Israel devastated the Palestinian community. It's fragmented to five entities at least. You have the Jerusalemites who are now surrounded by a wall, about 200 of quarter of a million Palestinians, and not only Arab Israelis, Palestinians who are caught inside Israel. Then you have the Palestinian community in the West Bank. Then you have the Gaza, and then you have the refugees. And then you have the refugees are not in their surrounding, but in the world at large. Now, this is a fragmented society. To, to create a coordinated thing there, it's not that easy. The interests are very different. You see now that among the, the Palestinians who are inside Jerusalem, meaning inside the world, in Jerusalem, Something that was a taboo in the Palestinian, they are now queuing to get Israeli resident and Israeli identity card. And, and, uh, and uh, this is sort of, I mean, those who make their living as doctors, they move to Hamal and so but many, most of them want to stay. And they have a very different interest even from the people on the other side in Abu Dhis, the differences are huge. If you are a teacher in Jabal Bukhada and you get your salary from an Israeli municipality, and you are teaching in elementary school, you get five, your salary is five more times than the, on the other side in Abu Dhis. So, I mean, and that's, it's like the situation in Northern Ireland. Many of the people in the north, I mean, the Catholics, they, they, they knew that there was something to lose in joining the republic at that time. So it depends. It's a fragmented society. And to coordinate that, they, I mean, as I said, and it's a whole process of divide and rule that turned out to be quite successful. Quite successful. It's not that you only, I mean, there is Israel, with all, its, with all the division, but still Israel, and then there is a Palestinian, it's, on a, it's a sort of a magic. And, but what you describe, it's, it's hard, it's a tough one. You ask me what, how I evaluate the success of a boycott, will it bring 
Israel to its knees and therefore force I don't see it on the contrary. On the contrary. Oh, shall we come to the end of our time? So I'd like to ask uh, 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 Okay. Uh, actually, let's. You can ask afterwards. Let, let's. We've got people here, with kids and stuff. So let's go ahead and thank Avishai for his time. And anybody who wants to say.